During the 19th century, millions of immigrants left the ports of Europe for America, Africa, and Australia. And the camera went with them. The immigrant ships leaving ports like Liverpool carried millions of North Europeans away from the hardship of life in the land and the squalor of the Industrial Revolution. But brutal times bred ruthless people, as those who stood in the path of their advance were to discover. The battle cry of that age was survival of the fittest. The native people of Tasmania were exterminated by the settlers. They survive only in photographs. When the Bishop of Tasmania took his camera on a day trip to see the natives in 1858, he found only 15 left alive. The last of these Tasmanians to die in 1876 was dismembered and put on display in a museum. These aborigines in Australia were brought from the outback and carefully posed in a portrait studio. In 1872, a handbook for immigrants said, after one or two palpable evidences of the superior power of the white man, they're forced to recognize his supremacy. Once the black commences loafing about the more civilized parts, he is sure to die off rapidly. In 1872, the two immigrants who ran this photographic studio in more civilized parts were Beaufoy Mellon and his assistant Charles Bayliss, who set up shop in the mining towns thrown up by the gold rush, which had just doubled the white population of Australia. Mellon and horseback spent months in the raw towns of Hill End and Gulgong, taking photographs of immigrants outside their homes. It was a commercial venture but it ended up as a remarkable piece of visual history. The portraits of these merchants in Gogong now decorate Australia's banknotes. A hundred years ago, Photographs like these were used to show the folks back home how a man could prosper. Above all, Merlin's photographs proclaim the pride and self-confidence of the white settlers. Another continent which excited the imagination of the Europeans was Africa. As the whites moved to take over South Africa, the photographers followed them in. 
This picture is by H.F. Gross, the first professional to set up in the Transvaal. The Boer settlers looked for a farm of at least 6,000 acres. Prospects for the white immigrants seemed boundless. last quarter of the century, there were more than 600 professional photographers at work in South Africa. And there were cameras on hand when diamonds were discovered in the land of two farmers called De Beer. The English did best in the diamond rush, led by a man with visions of imperial destiny, Cecil Rhodes. Rhodes once asked that his fortune be used to establish a secret society, the true aim and object of which shall be the extension of British rule throughout the world, and especially the occupation by British settlers of the entire continent of Africa, the Holy Land, and the seaboard of China and Japan, and the ultimate recovery of the United States of America. Rhodes' great wealth came from his diamond claims. This photograph shows the original open cast operation where the clay was hauled up on a web of ropes. Africans were soon drafted into the mines to work for the white prospectors. At the end of a shift, African laborers were searched for hidden diamonds. Rhodes Enterprise grew into the great De Beers diamond empire and many of these mining photographs come from the company archives but others must have been sold commercially because they also turn up in old travel albums these laborers lined up for medical inspection seem to have been posed for the benefit of the camera For the white settlers, South Africa had some very obvious attractions. But it was the other Africa which fascinated the photo buying public. Charles Wilson came to Africa in the 1890s to take pictures for his father's company back in Scotland. Wilson posed the Zulus as fierce but noble savages. Some of Wilson's studies are surprisingly modern in style. He captioned this photograph of children at the window, Curiosity. And like many old photographs taken in lands overrun by white settlers, the camera in Africa recorded the confusion of cultures. This 
ceremonial parade of American Indians is now just an annual event for tourists in New Mexico. The desert lands of the Southwest first became a hunting ground for American photographers a century before. The early photographers who came to the Southwest traveled in government-sponsored expeditions along with companies of soldiers to protect them from the nomadic tribes like the Navajo. This is the Pueblo of the Zunis. The Zuni Indians settled in their villages seemed to feel much less threatened by the coming of the white man. And they were certainly a lot more friendly. That's probably one of the main reasons why in the 1870s the early photographers took so many pictures of Pueblo Indians. This ritual dance at the Zuni Pueblo was photographed by one of the great pioneer cameramen of the American West, William Henry Jackson, who took thousands of pictures of the Indians of the Southwestern Territories. But it was the Plains Indians to the north and the great prairies of America who suffered most at the hands of the white settlers. The Indians fought back in 1862 in Minnesota. These are the survivors of a Sioux Rising which massacred 450 whites. This group portrait of those who escaped was taken by one of the survivors an amateur photographer called Adrian Ebel. A professional photographer, B.J. Upton, took this panorama of the compound in which 2,000 Sioux were imprisoned after their attempt in 1862 to stop the westward advance of the whites. Most of those early immigrants massed in the cities of the East Coast but after the American Civil War was over, they moved westwards in strength. And that's when the real tragedy began. The American Indians were driven from their traditional hunting lands and their buffalo were destroyed. And the Indians, as they fought back, soon faced 25,000 government soldiers in the field who fought more than 200 actions against them in the 1870s. Many of the veteran photographers from the American Civil War also took the trail west. So, as the way of life of the Indians was destroyed by the settlers and soldiers. It was simultaneously being preserved on pictures by the cameramen. The burial platform of a Sioux warrior on the prairies of Montana was photographed by Leighton Hoffman. Hoffman became a frontier photographer, just as the animals which kept the Indians alive were being wiped out. This photograph is captioned, five minutes work. A Sioux chief said, wherever the whites are established, the buffalo is gone and the red hunters must die of hunger. In a few years after 1872, three million buffalo were killed by white hunters. Hoffman worked as a guide to the hunting parties, then photographed the destruction for sale to the public.
Hoffman invited Indians to dress up and pose in his log cabin for studio portraits, which he could also sell to the public. Hoffman was later elected as a state representative by the settlers who trekked into Montana, but he mourned for the old days. I would that there were yet a few waste places left untouched by the settler and his cursed wire fences. Good in its way, but not for me. I cannot help it. By the 1880s, the Deadwood stage felt safe enough to take local businessmen for day trips in the Black Hills of Dakota. The tranquil side of life was recorded by a professional photographer called Grabble, who followed the cattlemen and sheep farmers into the once wild west. Soldiers penned the Indians into reservations. Indian resistance had been broken by the armies of what was, by now, the most rapidly growing industrial power in the world. Once the Indians had been subdued, the West was secured for the white settlers by the railroad. But many of these tracks across the prairies and mountains and deserts were bought with the lives of another race, the Chinese. The Chinese had been into the West in the early days, cooking for the cowboys, working as servants, or running laundries in the frontier towns. But to build the railways, tens of thousands of them were brought into America as cheap coolie labor. The railways were pushed through at such a killing pace that many of the Chinese just died by the tracks. The forced march of the railways began just after the American Civil War. Using thousands of Chinese laborers, whose coolie hats leave them faceless in the photographs, the Central Pacific Railroad crossed the Sierra Nevada mountains in one of the great engineering feats of the 19th century. It was a competitive time, and the railroad companies hired some of the best photographers to report their achievements. The photos could be sold to passengers, or sent east to lure the public and impress the stockholders. Naturally, an official photographer was there for the historic moment in 1869, when the rails finally met and a gold spike was driven in to link east and west. As the railways brought the farmers further west, in the 1880s a remarkable photo history of the sodbusters of Custer County, Nebraska, was begun by Solomon Butcher, who combined photography with farming. It was an ambitious plan which contrasted with a primitive rural life. The American West was also a rich source of memorable and marketable images. These are the victims of a shootout between the Jewy gang and the Berries. Frontier justice was also on public display. This picture of a saloon in Dodge City claims that the barman is Sheriff Bat Masterton's brother.
This hunter was scalped outside Fort Worth in 1868. Two years before, a war party cut the head off Ridgeway Glover, a photographer who had set out, he said, to illustrate the life and character of the wild men of the prairies. Will Sewell photographed the warriors of the Southern Plains in the 1870s, now kept in their bleak reservations. Oklahoma was Indian territory, but as the whites ran out of land, the time came to break another treaty. Thousands of would-be settlers were lured west by the slogan, Oklahoma, the last chance. In Oklahoma, the last fertile land taken from the Indians was offered free to whites prepared to take part in an astonishing scramble. Between 1889 and 1893, photographers documented these land grabs. Wagon loads of families and adventurers arrived and settled down to wait in tent cities, complete with saloons and brothels. The climax came at high noon on the 16th of September, 1893. A single shot was fired, and the race was on. A hundred and sixty acres free to every man fast enough to stake a claim. During this astonishing auction, a squad of sheriffs and marshals kept the peace in the boom towns of the last white frontier. The wild reign of the cowboy lasted only a generation. By the end of the century, he worked for a ranching industry, little more than a hired hand with a romantic past. These photographs taken by W.D. Harper in Colorado suggest that the dangers of the old days had soon given way to clean shirts and nostalgic bravado. But during the breaking of the West, the camera had seen behind the romantic image. The old Indian in the top hat was still a prisoner of war when this photograph was taken in 1905. He is Geronimo, chief of the Apaches. episode of Camera, News Flashes, Gus MacDonald shows how photography first caught people in motion, overcame its fear of the dark, 
and went on to produce the earliest pictures of stunts, disasters, and the events we now call news.